right, so welcome everyone. I hope the, the lunch was, 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 was nice. Uh, thank you, for, uh, Pierre Michel, uh, Philippe Patricia, for the uh, invite here. It's great to see economists and sociologists in the same room. Uh, and as you will see, the, the style of work I do is completely different from what we saw this morning, and not just the colors on the slides. Huh? Um, just to warn you as a caveat, uh, the way we put it, like, there is theory, a lot of it, and then data. So it's a quantitative paper that we spend more time on, uh, on the theory, explaining the context, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the paper is co-authored with Hang Jun Cho, who was a young professor in Hong Kong, was also my PhD student at INSEAD, and Charles Galunich, uh, also a professor at INSEAD, in the OB group of myself, an associate professor at INSEAD in organizational behavior, but a sociologist by, uh, by training. When I read the theme of the, of the conference today, I mean, you started with entrepreneurship, and the thing is my paper addresses risk, talent, and innovation, but not entrepreneurship, so I hope it's fine. Uh, I can talk about it if needed, but this is not... Yeah, exactly. It's like, why am I here? It's like, uh, innovation. In, on top of it, it's not even innovation. It's creativity. I'll talk about this. Um, all right. So it's about mobility shocks and organizational creativity. So we're looking. The outcome variable is organi organizational creativity, how organizations are collectively creative. We're looking, looking at mobility shocks, which is you know, when you have someone moving at the top in the top management team. And then we look at what kind of things can actually shield organizations from this type of external shocks. And we look at how uh, these organizations use what we call co uh, um, cultural elements, which because the context is fashion is going to be stylistic elements. And I'll tell you more um, about this. All right, so the conceptual space is creativity and networks. So we have in the room here, uh, uh, we're not an expert, expert on creativity, Pierre-Michel. Uh, it is uh, something big. Uh, everyone wants to be creative. To some extent, we must be creative today. Uh, there is what we call an imperative in modern society to be creative. A, a German sociologist called call that even the age of creativity. And perhaps it's a holy grail. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, this is what drives wealth, success. Um, and perhaps it's too much. I don't know. And it's also related to this concept of, of, of innovation. I comment more on how those two are uh, interrelated. Um, and we're really going through something what we, what that we call the creativitization of the world, right? It's like everything must be creative at all time. We must be creative. And if we're not creative, we're out, uh, out of the loop. Voilà. So, Pierre-Michel, citing your work here. Academically, it's a very uh, um, slippery term. Uh, there is a great quote by Sean Kaufman on this. Notoriously slippery term. Uh, and the definition is contested. Uh, I even wrote a paper about this saying, you know, you have dozens of definitions, people disagree, it's being challenged. Uh, but nonetheless, because it's uh, empirical research, we need, we need something to agree upon, right? And it is main definition, at least in the field of OB, organizational behavior, which says that creativity is something novel and useful. Now, let me tell you right away, sociologists are going to disagree, saying, like, it's about novelty, not being useful. <laughs> Don't worry, it's fine. It's fine, you can take you. Uh, and then uh, usefulness, right? Usefulness is, com we will see for fashion, is something that can be commercially successful. And, and in that field, we say creativity is something that combines those two, right? Now, creativity is not necessarily innovation. Uh, it's not necessarily that it's something that is out there. Uh, but often we talk about the creativity of innovations. Right? Once the products are released, are they creative or not, right? And that's, that's a key difference. We all agree that it comes from recombination. Uh, that's at the heart of the, uh, of the concept. I will explain how it plays out in, uh, in the fashion industry. Um, it is in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, it's audiences that tell us what is creative or not. I mean, think about movies, fashion, I mean, all the creative industries. I mean, it's really hard to, ar to argue what, when, what movie is better, you know. We, we, we don't know, right? It, we decide. And it's also a multi-level construct. Uh, we can assess the creativity of individuals, the creativity of teams, the creativity of organizations, and potentially also the creativity of countries. And this is the first concept, right? So again, this is the outcome variable. This is, we're going to try, we're going to, to, try to explain this, to explain the concept of, uh, of creativity. The second one is networks. Uh, well, I guess everyone knows what a network is. Uh, also, you know, apparently a concept that's been quite successful in economics lately, but, you know, uh, it's been around for a, wh uh, a while in, um, in sociology. And it's well known to be a key antecedent of, uh, of creativity, right? So your position as an individual in a network, okay, for several reasons, because it gives you access to ideas, resources, uh, 
And even better if you're a broker, if you're connected to people who are otherwise unconnected or disconnected, uh, you can play with that, right? These ideas are called non-redundant and that is going to make you even more uh, creative. So there is a huge tradition on this. Uh, sometimes you can also close those structural holes, as we call them, uh, by connecting people, right? And it's also expected to make you more creative, okay? So when you look at connections among people, organization, teams, uh, there is something going on. And, and the structural position, the way you're connected to others is going to explain your creativity, right? And we see how uh, the independent variable is a position within the structure and the outcome variable is um, creativity. Now, if we think, uh, and by the way, I'm very happy that LVMH is uh, sponsoring this uh, conference because we're going to talk about high in fashion and here we have a beautiful LVMH brand, uh, Dior. Uh, and our first guiding assumption uh, in the fashion industry, because this is our context, uh, is that some people matter more than others when it comes to creativity, right? I mean, I understand that everyone matters and you have a, a structure, you have a team, you have various people in marketing and so on. But in this industry, and it's true also in other industries, you do have people called creative directors, right? And when they move around, it really has an impact on the organization. It's really disruptive, okay? So here, who, who knows who that is? That, that uh, it's a very famous Italian woman, <laughs> now the head of uh, Malagrazia Curie, okay, uh, joined Dior. And in the long history of movement at Dior that has been quite disruptive with John Galliano getting fired, Ralph Simons leaving, uh, and so on and so forth. The second assumption we'll talk about momentarily, but look, I mean, that issue of, of mobility of people at the top, or so, some people matter more than others for, when it comes to creativity, it's not just fashion or the creative industries, you also uh, here, Johnny Hive at Apple, in charge of creativity, to a large extent responsible for the success of, of the company, right? Because high-tech companies rely on creativity um, to be successful on style um, associated with, um, with, uh, with innovation. The second guiding assumption, again, is that creativity comes uh, from networks. So the ability to produce products, services, whatever, that are both novel and useful because it's our definition, comes from networks, and for a long time in, in that field, in sociology, OB, we've looked at how people are connected, right? So it's a human thing. And something else now is emerging, we're looking at ideas, right? So it's not just about the networks of people and actors, it's also about the structure of the ideas themselves, right? And in that sense, we talk about semantic networks, networks of cultural elements, and so on and so forth. So you have a first structure, which is how people are interconnected. In fact, if you go back to Levi-Strauss and others in, in anthropology, that's that notion. Uh, also, uh, um, you know, in sociology. But here we're moving and away from that and we're saying, you know, it's per perhaps that's true, right? And it's certainly true. But it's also the ideas, the concepts, the cultural uh, elements. Um, now, when I say cultural element, it's pretty broad. And again, you will see that because we're talking about fashion, it's the stylistic elements and I will show you the data. Um, but it could be anything. I mean, if you look at other creative industries, it could be the genres. Uh, and we have a network of, of colleagues um, uh, looking at, at the movie industry, uh, architecture, uh, uh, music, and so on. And they look at how genres, styles uh, emerge uh, and their dynamics, right? And here you have a nice picture of the evolution of, of film genres, uh, you know, the extent to which they are used uh, in the industry over time. I think the second talk is actually, you know, is a, the next talk is about the movie industry. So, okay, that kind of things. Um, it could also be like genres in music, a lot of work on this by colleagues like Noah Askin and so on, uh, um, uh, Irvine in California. Uh, and then also in politics, right? We could also, there are papers in political science looking at how political ideas are interconnected and how their position with a certain structure is going to make them successful or not. Now, two things. This is highly field specific. Uh, so that's why we're looking at specific industries. Now, fashion is a big one, right? We're talking about two or three trillion and you know, very powerful sponsors. So that is relevant, but you could look at other industries. And the second thing is that some of these styles are uh, contested, okay, which also raises the notion of uh, cultural appropriation. Uh, and I'm going to, to, talk, um, to talk about this. Now, when we look at uh, the context, right? So fashion, and by the way, if you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, for those of you who know the industry and we're in Paris, so that's, you know, you've been exposed, you know, uh, there is dimensions, uh, so when it's coded by the specialists in this field and the designer, they think about the prints and the patterns that you see there. They think about the colors, the fabrics, could be silk, whatever, the looks and the style. Here you have the military style, 
and a fifth element, which basically is the trims and the embellishment, right? And so whenever, whenever you have a fashion collection, you have to think about this, right? When you, when you look at fashion shows, when you look at the, the collections, you can reference those five dimensions, and they are like the underlying um, um, categories um, that drive uh, stylistic elements in that, uh, in that industry. And exactly what we did, so we looked at the organizations and we looked at the styles or the stylistic elements that they actually use, okay? Uh, our data set is exhaustive on the industry. I will tell you more about this um, um, in a moment. So, but it's not just the, the, the elements, it's also the toolkits, right? Because it's not that you, you take red or blue, depending on what is in fashion. Uh, you take red or blue, and then you use silk or leather, and then you use the military look or something else, okay? And you associate. And what matters, are, and remember when I said that creativity is about recomb recombining things, recombination, uh, this is what we looked at. We looked at the toolkits of these houses, right? Uh, and these stylistic elements, they are used by designers to create the collections. They, for them, the way they think is like they associate those elements and they create, uh, and they create something. So we have three research questions. Um, and and we, have a regression, we have regressions at the end, and don't worry uh, if you want. <laughs> it's fine, we have a huge data set, but you know, as a sociologist, I, you know, I, love, I love theory, so sorry about this. Um, so we're moving from actor-centric to IG-centric networks. Um, and we're looking at the features of these cultural tools kits. So first, we're going to look at whether the structural, the network structure of the toolkits uh, matter for success, for creativity. Two, whether mobility at the top is going to disrupt actually creativity, which is that notion of external shock. And three, whether you know, having a certain type of toolkit, presumably a toolkit that is highly embedded in the network, is going to protect you. Voilà. Three questions. So hypothesis, uh, here I'm combining two, two streams of, of my work, one on, on what we call personal mobility networks, how people move across organizations and how you know, that impacts success, uh, innovation, in fact, and creativity. And the other one is about the cultural dynamics of, uh, of industries, you know, how, what makes cultural elements popular. So this is one example of, of what you could see on the, on the catwalk, uh, and you can see the mix of styles here and fabrics, colors, uh, trims, embellishments, and so on and so forth. So the first one is about the, uh, the network structure. And here I want to read one quote. So basically, you know, the, the research design that, that we used, uh, and it's actually used a lot uh, in the film now, is mixed methods. I mean, we usually do that because we need to understand, I mean, what is going, what is going on in the field? What is going on, you know, how do fashion designers, for example, make decisions? How do film directors make decisions. I mean, it's impossible to just look at, at the data, I mean, and not understand the context, because also that drives, you know, the way we understand mechanisms. One quote from one designer we interviewed, let's say that you want to design a collection of four women's wear with the concept of 18th century women. The first thing you do is to figure out how other designers in different fashion houses understood this concept before today. Um, they really look at the archives and the history, something that they know. Uh, as you go through the styles in the style books, you sort, out, sort of understand how other houses use color, trims, fabrics, and so on for that specific style and how their sales performance ended up, right? They always look at whether the house was successful eventually or not. Um, after studying all of that, you make changes, some are major or the minor, and you reinterpret it, it in your own creative way, right? So there is something that is out there in the field. They, they try to reinterpret, understand what's going on, look at the impact in the past, who used it when, and then they create their own, uh, their own collections. Recently, there was Balmain, uh, you know, Olivier Roustin, that said, you know, he's going to mix Marie Antoinette and, uh, and Kurt Cobain. You know? So that's the kind of... Uh, and the result is actually quite brilliant, surprisingly. A bit strange, but... Uh, so that's really the way, the way they think. Now, um, some elements are different than others. So basically, some elements are highly embedded, right? It means that they have been used in the past with many other elements. And I will show you like a picture of what that means. But these are elements that are very central, um, that are broad, that you know, have been used with other elements in the past. And this is what we call highly associative elements, right? So it means that, um, I can give example, I will show you a list, but you know, the color black, the color white, for example, they're easy to use with a lot of, of, of fabrics, a lot of patterns, trims and embellishments, and so on and so forth. Now, Toolkits that are highly affiliated, you know, highly embedded, 
uh, they're great because they help you connect with more styles. They give you more breadth and more opportunities and more ways to recombine uh, and they maximize that key element um, in creativity. And I will show you how it looks like. So that's the first hypothesis that we have. It's like organizations, and so in that case, fashion houses that use that kind of toolkits uh, with elements that are highly connected, they will receive higher creative evaluations, right? And I will show you, again, I mean, that notion of creativity is not us researchers evaluating because we don't have the skills to do that. And plus, we'd have to travel back in time because it's highly context dependent. But we have experts, and I will tell you more about them, who do that for us, right? Um, so using these toolkits is great uh, because not only it helps you, you know, create better narratives, you can use more styles because they're more connected and so on. It leads to something we call in sociology uh, optimal distinctiveness, which is that you know, the key to success in these fields is to be different but not too much. So you don't, you don't want to be like the others, but you don't want, you don't want to be too different, right? And that, like countless examples in the industry where people try to be too different and actually they failed. Or if you like the others, why would consumers buy your products? Uh, and, and, and no way are you going to be evaluated as being creative. And the last thing is, you know, those styles uh, internally, they, they really help train people. Right? They give you access to more, you know, more designs in the past. And there is this research on the, what, what they call ecologies of innovation, right? You're going to get exposed to a lot of things, and you're going to get a better training. And that's better for the organization. The second one is about the risk. And that's another quote. So the management and a new creative director talk to each other a lot before and after hiring. Right? So it's a very important process. I'll give you the example of Maria Greta Curie. I mean, we're talking about houses that make billions. right? I mean, look at the, the, the market cap of LVMH, the, the biggest in Europe. Uh, these days, uh, a lot of it comes from, uh, from the creativity of the creative directors. I mean, so that hiring decision is, is, is fundamental, okay? Uh, of course, inviting a new creative director is one of the biggest events to the firm since they pour a lot of resources. Um, the salary of, um, of uh, Half Simons at Calvin Klein was $18 million, okay? So that's the kind of things we're talking about. After being hired, she, uh, in the, she's talking about the specific creative directors, is selling the firm as the captain. She should know everything about the up-to-date fashion trends and how she wants her designers to work by feeding her designers with new inspirations and creative changes. Now, when you look at the research on this specifically, the impact of mobility at the top on performance, uh, there is an upside. It's great because you remove creative directors or top managers who are not performing well, and that gives you a, an opportunity to actually hire um, a good one, potentially. At the same time, it's super expensive. Right, as I said, uh, and it's resource depleting. And uh, the new creative talents, they may come with expensive dreams, okay? Uh, they want to change everything. They're not you know, thinking about the heritage of the brand, for example. And what's, that's what happened at, to Ralph Simons at Calvin Klein because you know, he got fired eventually. A lot of operational and coordination costs. Um, you know, uh, they're not used to work together. There are people who have been uh, in the organization forever. And it's hard to learn from, uh, from each other. So all in all, and I will show you over time, I mean, we, here we're saying near term, uh, you will see that after three years, basically, there is a positive impact on the, uh, on the creativity, which is interesting. I mean, we find this effect also in the finance industry. I will tell you more about this. Uh, but near term, one, two seasons, is actually negative. And this is the hypothesis that we have. And the last thing, the last hypothesis, uh, last hypothesis before I move to the, to the data, uh, is that these elements that I talked about that are highly affiliative, they, are, they, they act as shields. So you have a fashion house, you have an organization in the creative industries that is impacted by the external shock, and, and their creativity goes down, right? And creativity generates profit. And that's a, that's a big risk. That's a big risk. And they need to find ways to sh protect their organization, right? And here, again, we're talking about organizations. And what we're saying is that those highly connected elements or toolkits protect them, okay? Why? Because they help the uh, old team and newcomer uh, communicate, and also to a large extent, they reassure the audiences that you know, evaluate you, right? It's like, okay, sure, you have this external shock and we know it's bad, but same time you're going for something relatively safe, okay? And that mitigates um, the risk. And here, we, uh, we hypothesize, it's actually an interaction effect between uh, the two first um, variables. Well, any question at this stage? Or, you know, usually I 
take questions at the end, but I understand that the context is, uh, you're, you're all familiar with the fashion industry, that's what I, I gather. It was so clear that, uh, it took me a while to be clear about this industry, it's quite, um, it's quite, you know, it's quite complicated. All right, but you understand? I fashion industry is highly certified, you have the kind of research yes. lab, uh -huh. and then the yes. ready-to-wear. That, that's a very good question, thank you, Pierre Michel. So here we're talking about high-end. So high-end fashion, so the, exactly the brand of the, you know, the, <laughs> the sponsor here, um, they, they are the ones driving um, trends in the industry, okay? So you have, you have the high-end fashion industry, high fashion, okay? And this, these are the, the, uh, the firms also like showing on the fashion shows and so on, on the catwalk. Then you do have some very creative, innovative small houses that often do not show on the catwalk, and that's interesting because those firms, they would be more like novel than creative in the way, in the, time of termin the type of terminology that we're using. And then you, you have the super commercial brands like Zara and others that are more like on the uh, useful or appropriate or commercial than novel. And, and here with that segment of the industry, we're really like talking about creativity as defined in the field, which is novel and useful. So you need to have something fresh, okay? But you also need to have something that sells. And that's that combination of the two that basically uh, is creativity. In the way we defined it, uh, and now obviously we can disagree <laughs> about the definition. Uh, yes. You said earlier, of course, whether one creative direction goes to somewhere else is not random. It is not. There's lots of reasons why yeah, yeah. that happens. <clears throat> I wonder whether you thought of how to deal with that. I mean, yeah. in the CEO leadership, for example, some people use unexpected yeah. deaths or yeah. some exogenous reasons yes. why yes. maybe a creative Yes. Yeah, yeah, we, we thought about this. I mean, in fact, uh, we thought about, you know, what would be an exogenous shock, maybe the death of a designer, or something. it doesn't happen often. Uh, but we're trying to control for some of these explanations. So, for example, I mean, we've seen the data, but it's like, uh, first there may be this notion of match, matching between the house and the designer. You know, perhaps they move to houses that are more like them, or perhaps less like them, you know, something empirically to answer. Uh, also, like path performance, going up or down. Uh, there are some elements there, right? But that's, that's for us, the way we do it. Like we control at the performance. Where is the house going? Um, because these events are not random, as you said, right? But the question is also whether the, uh, you know, what is the impact overall and whether the uh, certain elements that are highly embedded are going to protect the house or not. But we do our best. Now, the, the issue of endogeneity is like, it's a big one in economics, so I'm very, very careful here. Uh, but we'll talk about the, uh, the, the models. Now, so the, the data set, um, so collected manually. Now, the good news with this kind of data, because it's public, it's, hard, it's really hard to fake or forge. <laughs> it's like, you know, um, everything is public, right? Um, and, and so the, the first, the outcome viable, as I said, is uh, an evaluation of creativity done by buyers. Buyers in the fashion industry are very central. They are the ones who evaluate the uh, creative potential of brands, right? So both their novelty and usefulness. And uh, so each season we have about 70 of them and they basically rate uh, the houses and they use a system uh, that is, so you know the uh, uh, Eurovision song contest. <laughs> they, they, use the, they use the same system, <laughs> which is, uh, apparently there is work on this in statistics that is actually very great to rank. So I, I would believe, I believe that, okay. Uh, and so they give points, and, uh, and there are various ways of like, dealing with, so either you add the points or you average, I mean, depending on the type of variable you want and so on and so forth. But that's, that's, the, uh, that's the way the, it's measured. So every season after, obviously, the fashion shows, the buyers are being asked to evaluate. Now, obviously, this, all this is influenced by various things like the status or the reputation or the size of the house and so on and so forth, but we, we, we control for all this. Uh, one example, so it's in French, of the, uh, so I'll give you one from 2015, uh, how it goes up, uh, up, up and down. Uh, so relatively stable, and then sometimes you have newcomers like Valentino, uh, you know, who was the creative director of Valentino? <laughs> Maria Grazia, I guess, like I'm asking there because some Italian expertise in, in that role here. <laughs> All right, so she was the creative director of Valentino and then was, uh, you know, became super famous, and, and, and guess what? LVMH hired her to become the um, new designer at, um, at Dior. Uh, you can see other brands super stable, uh, other brands going down, and so on and so forth. So, uh, just that is super interesting. Now, obviously, we do have the names and affiliations of the evaluators. 
it's not something that we have used in, in, uh, in our research, but potentially uh, research questions there. Now, the, so that was the out, uh, DV. Uh, the IV, the main one on styles, also external data. Uh, so we use something called WGSN. So in the creative industries, often you do have organizations that, that, that collect data about the industry, right? So think about IMDb uh, in movies, uh, uh, music would be, I mean, Spotify has a lot of data and so on and so forth. In fashion is WGSN, uh, which has, by the way, been nicknamed the Bloomberg of fashion. I mean, you would kind, so that's that level, that level of information that you get on the industry. And they do everything. So they, they, they collect data on the styles of each house. Uh, they make predictions, which in itself is fascinating because they're always super right, you know. And, and, and the reason is because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy to a large extent, right? Because everyone uses WGSN or about 95% of the houses in the market. Uh, they know what's going on and they know basically how to converge. So the, fun like the institutional function of that kind of actors, and, and they have a quasi-monopoly in the industry, is that they give you a boundary of where you should be in terms of, of the positioning, right? And then the fashion houses, they play within, within that field, trying to be op optimally distinctive, not too, not too much like the others, but not too different either, okay? So that's the data set, it's a huge data set. It's like it's an endless stream of data, uh, and, uh, and that's, that's what we use. So that, that's one example of the, of the data that you can see there. Uh, so, for example, they're going to look at the key colors, and you know here they will look at silver, for example, right? And they give they, they give you a a, um, a a definition of what it is, and then they show the houses that use them. They even give you the Pantone code. Uh, there was a paper recently in uh, ASQ about the dynamics of colors, right? So, so and that's that's what you know we call uh, with colleagues we call that the aesthetic turn in strategy or management studies, or perhaps even sociology, uh, when all these elements are, are quite important, right? And so we're looking, we're looking at them. This is one example of the, the styles. Now there is a recording process that I can you know, talk more about, but it's, it works well. And, and so you see the usual color, the fabrics, uh, you know, a black cotton, florals, button, casual, this is the kind of things that, uh, that you can see. And there are about 200, uh, 210 elements. Some of them are contested, like fur. Uh, so we wrote actually a paper on that specifically. And, and, and the, the joke that I make is like, because there are 210 styles, I could, we could write potentially 210 papers, one paper on each style, right? What does it mean? What is the dynamics? Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, we did not necessarily account for that in that paper, uh, but it's, uh, it's out there. And also the, uh, the notion of cultural appropriation, which is um, quite important, but again, I mean, not the, the focus of the, uh, of the paper. How do we compute uh, the connectivity of, of, of the styles? And then I will show you like a, an image that you see visually what we mean. Uh, there is a very difficult temporal dimension in the industry. I mean, it's true also in all creative industries, but especially when you, when you think about networks, this notion of decay function, for how long should you account for ties and so on? It's very complicated. I mean, so usually we use several windows, uh, and here we went for a two-year window for four seasons, um, for a lot of reasons, because this is what you know, the industry believes uh, works well. Now, this is how, how we created the, uh, the, the, the networks. So remember, uh, the networks, they are like the independent variable, right? So for each element, so you have a house you know, using certain elements in their collection, uh, and then each element is embedded right, in, the, in, the, in the network of stylistic elements or cultural elements. And, and that embeddedness comes from how they've been associated together in the past. Okay? So that's this notion of history of the past. Imagine you have fashion houses like Gucci, Chanel, and Dior, for example, and then stylistic elements like military blue and leather, and they are connected. So for example, house, house C could be Gucci. They used uh, military blue and leather, right? And that would mean that if we go from two mode to one mode, for those of you who know networks, uh, you know that procedure. Uh, although again, I mean, it's been contested to some extent, but that's what we did. Uh, you will see that two is connected to one and three through C, which means that in the past, C, which could be Gucci, for example, has combined those elements in a, in, in a collection, which means that historically, those three can be combined, right? And, and that gives us a sense of their centrality, embeddedness, uh, affiliativity and so on and so forth. I mean, all these concepts have been used um, in the literature. 
And then we normalize. I mean, we have, uh, we have various measures. I mean, the paper is quite long on this specifically. Um, what are the most robust or central or affinitive elements over time? So you have, uh, you can do that. It's quite interesting. I mean, in a dis descriptive way. So perhaps I should write a, uh, we should write a book about it. Um, so for example, years 2002, 2003 was white, red, blue, black, and white. And then 2011, 12, you see blue is number one. And then uh, 2017, 18, it's white, pastels, brown, olive. And you see a very interesting evolution of colors, right? Uh, so for example, uh, 2011, 2012, purple, which for a long time was a color that was uh, taboo to a large extent, right? It was not great to use purple because it, re it has connotation of death and so on and, and religious connotations as well. Uh, but then suddenly the fashion industry tells us now it's okay. And you see that how that color now is used. Uh, the rise of the pastels, pastels uh, as well is uh, very significant. Uh, and then you look at, at, the, um, at the materials, the fabrics. Leather is still there, uh, question for how long. Uh, and then the patterns, the looks, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the classification. And you can see over time, I mean, I could show you all the data, but this is quite uh, impressive how, how it looks. Now, this uh, is a visual representation of, of a stylistic network. Uh, so this is the whole industry. So basically the whole of fashion is captured there. I mean, and, and here we're talking about the global industry. We're not just talking about Paris, or Milan, or, or London, or, or New York. It's everyone together. And, uh, and you can see how basically they are uh, interconnected. And you can see at the center, I mean, some of them are really more uh, embedded than, than others, right? And it's possible that those ones basically are uh, not only driving creativity and success, uh, but also like protect, uh, protect um, organizations. Any question at this stage? Uh, so now, the, this, what is interesting, like the styles are not clustered around cities or segments of the industry. And, you know, it's something that is critical in that industry. I mean, I guess it's also true in other in creative industries. It's like it's highly connected, okay? Uh, the, the, what you can do or cannot do is bounded. And, and if you go out of this, you're in trouble. And this is why some innovators basically uh, have, a, have a hard time. Yes. Key names, you know, and they are kind of leaders, a bit like I think of herd behavior, herding models, and they, yeah. and you know, so they can afford to go more onto the boundaries, and then they are followed. Yeah. Yeah. Is there? Yeah. Do, do, do you, did you observe some herding there? They're kind of. Uh, yeah, yeah. So when we I talk don't know, to Saint Laurent, La no, Herfeld, right. no, or whatever, <laughs> yeah. And we talked to Chanel, they said, oh, we don't care about, you know, WGS and so on. Although I, I, I know that yeah. they, they use the service because we are the ones deciding where, where we're going collectively. And, and that's quite interesting because, I mean, again, I mean, it's not necessarily the sub subject of the paper, but what's going on is WGSN and, and these style bureaus, they interview people first and, and the big names. And they, they kind of come up, there is an agreement, right? So there's an institutional mechanism that is going to, you know, there is hurting, but it's through the institution. You see what I mean? It's, like, it's not that they do something and the others imitate and follow. There is, and I know there are models in economics uh, that, that look at that, but there, there, there is this institutional level, because it takes time to produce, and it's also very risky. And it's okay, this is where we're going collectively. These are the colors for, you know, 20, right now we should, so 2023, 2025. These are the colors for 2025 potentially 2028 20, or 2030, and, and let's all agree about this. And, and, and that's what happens. But the influence of the big players, yes. I mean, in this discussion, although it's hard to capture, uh, because we don't know what's going, going on behind closed doors. I mean, it's just interviews and so on. But it appears in, 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 in what the institution does. Uh, and uh, yeah. At the same time, yeah, sure. I mean, when you look at the, in the previous paper, we looked at you know, so um, organizations that have a high status are going to have a followership in their style. So it's, it's in the previous organization science paper we, we looked at that. Um, at the same time, the big ones, very visible, is going to have a negative impact. So those who have influence are those that have super high status and not too much visibility. And they are the ones that are going to drive the, the, the crowds. Um, well, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent question. All right. Now, uh, sometimes she, the creative director, and, that, and that's the link between the team and the, because we looked at the team structure, right? Something, something, and perhaps that's more like management scholars who care about it, but they were like, okay, but the creative directors are not alone, 
right? You're talking about organizations, teams, so you should basically tell us more about it. Okay, so let's do that. Sometimes she, the creative director, tells us what to use specifically, but often the direction is abstract and broad, so our concept has so much room to be filled in with concrete designs. We designers just try to actualize the styles with detailed choices for color, fabric, patterns, and so on. So basically, the creative directors give the direction, but then you still have that team of people around trying to make sense of it, right? And then with their interpretation of the concept, we communicate back to her with our interpretation and suggestions. Something gets selected, something gets rejected. And here you can see the, the dynamics of innovation. And we repeat these processes until she is okay with something. The big show already starts within us. All right, so, I mean, again, the regression models, and here, you know, it's like, uh, I'm scared about endogeneity, but. Um, so we do have a bunch of control variables uh, that, you know, we keep adding. Um, as I said, the paper right now is under review at AMJ, so we, <laughs> we did whatever, uh, whatever we asked to do. Uh, but we're looking at various levels of analysis, the house, the team, but also the individual, right? Just so that we really focus on the um, stylistic um, elements. Um, we look at whether the elements are new within the house, within the field. We look at the recombination themselves um, and look at whether that drives the, uh, the creativity at the end. So we used uh, XTML um, in, um, in, in Stata. Uh, the, the three hypotheses were supported in that case. They seem to be relatively robust. Uh, and again, I mean, it's like, who knows, right? Uh, but there seems to be that, uh, that causal link uh, here, or at least it's a descriptive um, understanding of the, of the data. What I said is... So what was Outcome variable is, uh, so we did, se we, we tried several things. Uh, it was either the, num the count of points in the, you know, the, so you have the evaluators, uh, or we averaged. So we looked at, you know, what is the average number of points that you received. Uh, we did all kinds of treatment on the, we excluded some outliers, we, uh, yeah, we did plenty of things, right? So it's like the measure of Yeah, and it's, it's actually, yeah, it's a count variable, actually. I mean, if, if you look at the number of points, but at the same time, uh, you know, it could also be treated as a, as a continuous variable. We tried all, all kinds of, of approaches. Seems to be relatively robust, uh, you know. So the, and the hiring is negative, so would you Yes, hiring is negative, and I will tell you more about this. So basically, so the hiring has an, imp I mean, again, short term, right, near term, because it's dif if you look at the longer term, it's different. And, and this, is, this is key. Uh, so using highly embedded elements is actually positive. Uh, now the question is why we explain, you know, we gave some explanations around this. We say, well, it's because it helps you be, you know, optimal distinctive. Uh, it trains also the designers. I mean, there are various processes. Uh, and it also shields you because it, it helps you, like, establish the connection between um, the part of the organization that stayed and, 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 and the newcomer, right, and reduce conflict and also reassure um, external, um, external um, audiences. Yes? Yeah. Do yeah. Then the second one, yeah. regarding this hiring of creative director, I guess there are two ways where you end up doing that. One is, uh, one is you're unhappy with your current one and you replace him or her. The other one is you're super happy, but so is somebody else. And yeah, and, and the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, so we try to control for all of this. I mean, so indeed you can get a lot of zeros and I, that creates some issues. Uh, you know, around how many zeros you get, basically. So we tried all kinds of, 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 of models to, to solve that. Now, on the issue of whether, so we tracked, we looked also at, at whether there was, in the press, something was said about an internal conflict at the house. And usually, because we're looking at highly prof, you know, these people are well known, we're talking about how people are super well known, uh, we would know. Insiders would talk about it, and we could track and whether, you know, was there, was there a conflict or a trace of an internal conflict which would explain that the designer left. And then the other thing is to look at past performance as well, uh, which is, you know, I don't know, increasing creativity. I think we looked at that over the last three years and that, that would tell you that that designer is now super, and this is exactly what happened to Maria Grazia Curie at Valentino, because she was so good that then, you know, LVMH and Dior decided to hire her. And we have to account for this. Uh, now that creates, because these are uh, these events, not, they are not rare events technically, but there aren't many of them. So we're trying, you know, we're trying to find ways to, you know, address all these issues. So far it looks good, but again, I mean, 
this is a complicated data set. <laughs> so we are quite happy to have, uh, to have results. Uh, on the point, you know, again, it's the Euro, uh, Eurovision type of, of rating, which means they're not going to look at all the houses and evaluate. They're going to give 20 points to the best, 19 to the second one, 18, and so on and so forth. And that, and that changes a little bit the dynamics. If you want to have <laughs> So we kept, we kept uh, for the main model, we kept number of points. But again, so perhaps the average is, is better, but it works, um, it works as well. Now, this is the impact on, uh, on, um, on creativity. Uh, so it takes, it takes up to three years for the, uh, for the negative impact on creativity that comes with mobility to disappear, right? So, because we could wonder, right? Why, why would fashion houses hire New designer, if on, new designer, if on average it's negative, that's weird. It means that they're making, because they know that. Uh, in fact, it's like the longer term thing that interests them. It's like, okay, what is Maya Gratia going to do at Dior in the next three years? Not next year, not in two years, but in three years. Uh, and the, what is super interesting here, there is famous work by Boris Groisberg, uh, I believe at HBS, where they looked at the mobility of fashion, financial analysts and it's the same pattern of, of results, right? So in that case, for them, it's not, it's not creativity, right? It's, uh, it's something else, uh, if I remember correctly, is how they are being assessed by peers, okay? Or whether they received an award in the financial world. But the dynamics is the same, which is mobility first is bad, but then you can recover from it, right? And also in that research, they were looking at what would be the things that would help you mitigate that risk. And they looked at the mobility of teams, for example. Right? which we also look about. I mean, we, don't, we did not include all the control variables in the models because that would be 40. <laughs> it's like it's a bit too much. But the team effects does not work, by the way, in fashion, right? Because we don't have enough data. Uh, I don't know, it's not, it's not working. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong, but. Uh. I mean, one, one thing we do in economics was the event studies like this, which is quite nice, to look at what happened prior to the event. Yes. To see if there was different yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and so and that's what we're looking at the, the dynamics, the performance of the house and the designer. Now the thing is like it's super hard to, <laughs> it's like, it's pretty much the same. And we're not sure how to dis disentangle that. Uh, so again, it's, uh, for us we're thinking about it. And this notion of matching as well, uh, because perhaps what drives success is the matching. It's like they have the right person for the right house. And right now we're looking at, we're looking at the use of styles in the past. Uh, it's, it's something that reviewers want to know, by the way. Huh? <laughs> so, and, and, uh, and I think we have a solution, but again, we're been, because it's, it's not just about styles. I mean, there is another dimension of matching. Could be, I don't know, like personal, could be culture, could be the country of origin or the heritage. Uh, so we're trying with styles, but let's see, let's see where it goes. All right, so what we're doing, and I think um, I'm almost done. So we have three minutes. Um, so. Uh, closing thoughts. So adding again, I mean, the, 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 here the, um, we're talking about uh, management research. So something or strategy. Uh, there is a debate whether it's good or not to hire new people at the top. Some research would say yes, uh, like research on, uh, on, on NFL coaches and, and sports. And then some research would say no, like uh, on finance. Uh, now we're looking at something else, which is creativity, which is the first time that we see um, you know, that happening. The shocks are likely but not guaranteed, depending on the uh, temporal aspect, um, and it can be mitigated, right? And we look at innovation, we look at or, uh, yes. and we look also at yes. the revenue, uh, revenue. Yeah. 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 We look at the revenue side. So again, it's, it's very specific to the creative industries, and that's why we, we bound also the results there. It's like many of these corporations are not quoted, and so you're not gonna get results, right? Uh, so you're gonna get results of carrying or LVMH, I mean, I do have one study where we look at the link between creativity and, and, and uh, accounting uh, factors like uh, EBITDA and so on, but and it, there, is a connection, there is a correlation, uh, but it's at the group level, or, and, and many of these houses you don't know, you simply don't know. I mean, and that's one of the challenges. Uh, um, and, uh, and the other one is patents. So because we're looking at styles, I mean, you do have pa patents in fashion, right? But these are like for uh, textiles and or some processes, but for designs, you cannot. You, that's, that's a challenge. There used to be independent houses, and they, now they became part of groups. I mean, that, that has been a major evolution, uh, but you don't cover the long enough a period to have uh, 
the time where there were independent houses, you know, and then they were absorbed by groups. Yes, yes, yes. So, so we do has it changed? But those groups do yeah. many other things, not necessarily yeah. only yeah. fashion. Yeah. Some of them, yeah. yes, but not. so that has that changed? Do you see any kind of? Have you so, looked at that? Whether yeah, we do have. You know, we do have. A, actually, we do have a paper in SMJ on, on the groups. Yes, and so the groups have a positive impact on creativity. So basically, when you are affiliated to a conglomerate, and this is like, okay, yeah. it's like it was not sponsored, but. You know, yeah. but but it has a positive impact. It, it, it has a positive impact only if the groups, because it depends on the peers, right? Only if the, the group has peers that are highly creative or not creative at all. Those in the middle, they will tend to, dra to, to, to drag creativity down. Uh, but that's a criti yeah, critical point. Uh, uh, voilà. and, and again, we wanted to look at imitations of style within, within conglomerates as well, but that's a bit out of the scope. Uh, voilà. uh, perhaps I conclude, uh, last thing. Um, toolkits matter, uh, and here we're moving from actor to actor to networks of styles and ideas. Uh, so the field is moving there, also sociology. And then uh, going back to the name of the you know, talent, <laughs> so I have the word talent here. Um, uh, it's very helpful, right, for generating uh, novel and useful ideas. But it's not just talent, it's not just the individual, it's how the individual is embedded within a broader network of ideas, right? And this is how talent can be best, um, best expressed, is when you think about the structure of the industry from a cultural angle and perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.